this session of Look at the Book, we're going to just focus on the first verse of First Peter, and then next time uh, tackle part of verse 1 and part of verse 2 as we move into this magnificent witness, eyewitness word from Peter concerning the role of the church in a very hostile world. So, Father, as we live in that kind of world increasingly, I pray for you to teach us from this verse and from this book how you want us to live for the glory of Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read the two verses just so that we have the context before us. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's a very long and complex salutation. And next time we want to take up these prepositional phrases according to and in and for. But this time we focus only on this verse right here. Peter. We know who Peter is, right? One of the twelve apostles that Jesus appointed, an eyewitness of Jesus. So you might expect some personal reminiscences or personal touches here. For example, if you jump over to chapter 5 here, he says near the end, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, so he's willing to align himself with the elders, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So there's the claim to be an eyewitness of the very sufferings of Christ. It just gives me the shivers to think I am listening to a man talk who saw Jesus, who talked to Jesus, who saw the sufferings of Jesus, as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God. And I can't help but hear when he says to these, these elders to be the shepherds that they're supposed to be, I can't help but think that he always has ringing in his ears those words of Jesus in the last chapter of the Gospel of John. Do you love me, Peter? Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my flock. Shepherd my flock. Do you love me? I love you. Shepherd my flock. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. And so he's calling upon the elders to do their shepherding work along with, along with him. So Peter, an eyewitness, a stunning thing to me that we would have before us here a letter that an eyewitness of the very Lord Jesus wrote. An apostle, one of the twelve, an apostle is a is an authorized spokesman for another authority to speak on his behalf. And that's the way the apostles write their letters for us. They're writing them on behalf of Jesus Christ. And when we think of Jesus Christ here, this book makes very clear that this is not a representative of a dead man, like many teachers are. We we all have our favorite teachers who are dead. This is not one of those. This Jesus Christ, chapter 3, verse 21, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he is risen from the dead. When he died, he did not stay dead. But in three days, God raised him from the dead. And he has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God in the place of great dignity and authority with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So this Jesus here that Peter is representing as an apostle has been raised from the dead and is reigning in heaven today. All authorities and all powers are under his feet and he rules as a king over the world. 
more. Rejoice, Peter says, insofar as you share Christ's suffering, so that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So this Jesus, who is presently reigning, is going to stand forth and reveal his glory someday. How? When? And when the chief shepherd appears. So the way his glory is going to be revealed is that he himself, the chief shepherd, is going to appear and you will receive, you you elders who have shepherded well, will receive the crown of glory. So Peter, imperfect sinner though he be, made an apostle, chosen, authorized, given the Holy Spirit to represent the living Christ who will one day reveal his glory by appearing himself, is writing this letter to those who are elect. We'll come back to that next time. Exiles, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are Roman provinces where Turkey is today. So this is a letter written to a whole group of of churches. And, And the last thing I want us to ask in this session is, what does it mean to be exiles of the dispersion? Um, is this dispersion the Jewish people dispersed outside Palestine? That's a common use of the word. Or is it the dispersion of Christians outside heaven, outside the kingdom, outside presence with Jesus in the world? And in that sense, exiles in the world, not exiles outside of, of Israel. What's the answer to that question? Who, who is he really writing to? Is this, is this elect Jewish people outside Israel who are Christian, or is this elect exiles of the dispersion and it's really Gentiles or everybody who is dispersed throughout the world and are exiled from heaven? One a possible answer to that question would be maybe to look at this. This is chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. He says to his readers, the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are now surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So the picture we have here of the readers is that once upon a time, they did join the Gentiles. They were part of this partying scene of sensuality and passions and drunkenness and orgies and drinking parties and lawless idolatry. That's not a description of the synagogue of Jews in the Hellenistic world. That's a picture of a debauched, first-century, Hellenistic, lawless people. And so it appears that when he says back here at the beginning, I am writing, Peter is writing, to the elect exiles of the dispersion, he's not talking about Jewish people here per se. They might be included, but he's talking mainly to Gentiles here. Now, do we have examples of this idea elsewhere in the New Testament? Well, here's one from Hebrews 11. These all, namely these Old Testament believers up through Abraham, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So here's, here's that concept of being an exile, not out of, outside of Israel, but outside of heaven on the earth. Our home is in another place with God. Or here's another picture of it in Philippians. So you have the writer to the Hebrews, you have Paul here. Our citizenship is in heaven 
and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. So our citizenship, from which we are presently a representative on the earth, is in heaven. We we are only secondarily citizens of the country we live in on the earth, and primarily we are citizens of heaven. And so, let's go back now to the beginning and sum it up. Peter, an eyewitness putting us in touch with the very sufferings of Christ that he himself saw and was made an heir of the glory that is to come. Peter is writing as an authorized spokesman with the authority of Jesus Christ, who is not a dead teacher, but is risen from the dead and is reigning with all angels and authorities and powers subject to him. And he is coming again someday so that his glory will be revealed when he personally appears. And this Peter, representing this Christ, is writing to us as exiles of the dispersion in the sense that we belong in heaven. We belong with our King, Jesus Christ. But he's coming again someday to make this world his own. And in the meantime, we are exiles in a foreign land, in a culture very hostile to us, is what this this book is really very much about. And you can see that here in chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh. That's what marks this world, which wage war against your soul. We have enemies waging war against our soul, trying to destroy us from being the citizens of heaven. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, They call us evildoers, perhaps, because we don't run with them into the flood of debauchery anymore. And now we try to live in such a way that as representatives of heaven, our our lifestyle is of another kind. It's born of the kind of Jesus. Jesus died to give us an example that we should walk in his footsteps, and so we will glorify God, we pray, on the day of visitation.